you know, I always wonder why there wasn't a black record label with its own black distribution company. Because, you know, if you notice, there are a lot of black record labels, but they usually split it 50 50 with the major white record companies for distribution. Now, the crazy part is they almost created one, though. There was some talk about putting a black distribution company together until everything fell apart back in the early 2000s. I remember uh, Suge Knight, Dame Dash, Jay Prince, and Irv Gotti were about to come together, put up some millions, and form a black distribution music company. And, you know, it was more like a union they was trying to start. So artists in every music genre could get health care, a retirement pension, and things like that. For when they get older and they're not selling records no more right they would you know they would have something to fall back on it was actually suge knight's idea who came up with the whole plan because he saw how basketball football and all types of entertainment you know they got unions and retirement options but as soon as it was about to happen all of a sudden they all got in trouble with the feds and had their offices raided and Computers, everything sees, and the plan of a black distribution company was never talked about again. But that's another story I'll do in the future, though. But, you know, when you think of black-owned record labels, though, usually the first one that comes to mind is Motown Records that was started by Barry Gordy. But before him, there were other black record labels like Broom Records, which is the first African-American-owned and operated record label in the United States, created by a guy named George W. Broom in 1919. Another one is Black Swan Records, which is the first African-American-owned label to record and press their own records. And that was started by Harry Pace in 1921 in Harlem, New York. And, you know, Black Swan was named after... Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, you know, she was known as the Black Swan, and she is also considered to be America's first black pop star. That's back in 1921, y'all. Another label, Chicago Black Patty Records, founded by Mayo Williams in 1927. Another one is Sunshine Records, run by the Spike Brothers out of Los Angeles. They also started back in the 1920s. Do Tone Records, created by Dootsie Williams in 1949. You know, he put out albums by Red Fox and Slappy White. And he put out the group The Penguins with that hit song, Earth Angel. But one label, one label took the world by storm and had black, white, all races going crazy from the music they was putting out. And that's VJ Records. VJ Records owned by an African-American couple, Vivian Carter and Jimmy Bracken. You know, they had artists like the Dells, Jerry Butler, Curtis Mayfield, the Staples Singers. This black-owned company was the first label to give the Beatles a shot at putting music out in America when nobody else would. They were the Beatles' first American label. And they had Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons, too. But see, VJ Records would have, they would have been the number one black owned record company in history. But they just had a lot of financial troubles, man. A lot of lawsuits. And a bunch of stuff was just holding them back from that title. At one point, they had so many records on the radio getting the airplay. The radio stations was hating. The white radio stations was hating and giving them a hard time. They were the first black label to cross over into the pop charts. It was ahead of their time, man. And it's crazy because you think about it, after this story, VJ Records kind of destroyed themselves. Chess Records, you know, had all the popular blues artists, and VJ was just putting out everything. R&B, soul, blues, pop, rock, doo-wop, jazz, country, you name it. And you know, Barry Gordy, he learned a lot. He learned, he learned from their mistakes and made Motown Records successful. You know, sometimes it sucks being first to do something, but because everybody gets to see what you did wrong and learn from it. It's not a bad thing, though. It's not a bad thing. But let's get into the story, though. And let's talk about Vivian Carter, who really was the queen and the head of the label. 
Now see, Vivian Carter was born March 25th, 1921 in Tunica, Mississippi. But she was raised in Gary, Indiana. You know, her parents, they moved from the South after World War I. Now, after she graduated high school, she took classes at a business college and then she joined the Signal Corps. You know, the Signal Corps is a branch of the Army responsible for military communications and stuff like that. And, you know, during World War II, she spent a year in Washington, D.C., but ended up moving to Chicago just to be closer to home to her family and friends. And that's where she met her husband, Jimmy Bracken. Now... Jimmy Bracken, he was born May 23rd, 1909 in Oklahoma, but grew up in Kansas City. But it was in Chicago where everything all started because see, Vivian ended up winning a contest for the best girl disc jockey in Chicago that legendary Chicago radio DJ Al Benson had going on at the time. He had a radio station on WGES radio. Now see, Al Benson very popular at the time and you know he helped a lot of artists careers by playing their music on air especially chess records he had a lot of power which was rare being a black man at that time in the late 1940s but you know he'd be on the radio for like 10 hours and he would play your song he'll play your song five times in a row if he liked it or you paid him <laughs> you know that payola was going on back then too but anyway so the contest right so out of thousands of people in that best male dj and female dj contest al benson was having you know you had to write a one minute commercial and read it for him at a hotel and you know what vivian she won she won the contest for the female and sid mccoy won for the males and the prize was an opportunity to host a 15 minute segment on al benson's radio platform and, you know, by her winning that, that helped launch her radio career. But, you know, after three months of being in Chicago, after she won that contest, you know, she went back home to Gary, Indiana, where her and her husband, Jimmy Bracken, opened up a record store. And the record store was called Vivian Record Shop. After that, she ended up joining a radio station at WJOB in Hamden, Indiana. And then around 1952, she left that station and joined another radio station, WJRY, and she had two shows on that show. You know, one show was called The Vivian Carter Show, and then she had another show called Vivian Spiritual Hour. But then she joined another radio station at WWCA and created her own show called Living with Vivian, which aired six nights a week. And that Living with Vivian show was very successful. And that one... That show made her a local celebrity with the teenagers because she played a lot of jazz, blues, gospel music from black artists. You know, the kids in the neighborhood will also come after school just, just to watch her through the glass store window. And, you know, she had the speakers out blasting her favorite songs. And she would take requests from the kids and ask them what songs they like or dislike to find out what was hot in the streets. And, you know, people started coming to her record store looking for, like, underground music that really wasn't on the radio. And, you know, she didn't have it available at the time. And that's when she got the bright idea to start making her own music and selling it out her store. So she figured by her having her own record store, plus being on the radio, that they could make money putting out their own music. Vivian and Jimmy wanted to be in that music business, and... That's when they decided to record some music from some of the local talent around the way in Gary, Indiana. So, you know, to get started, they needed some money. And they knew that the white people in charge at the time wouldn't give them a loan, not from the bank or credit card, because it was the 1950s. Racism was very bad at that time. Everything was segregated. So what they had to do is they borrowed money from a pawn shop. They had borrowed $500 from a pawn shop to start their record label, and they called the record label VJ Records, taking its name, you know, from their initials, Vivian for the V and Jimmy for the J. And they also brought in 
Calvin Carter, which is Vivian's young brother, to help run the A&R department. You know, he would help produce the records and was in charge of the recording sessions because, you know, he was a singer himself. And, you know, Vivian and Jimmy also got married right after they got that label going that year. They tied the knot. Now, the first group they started working with were called the Spaniels, who actually graduated from the same high school that Vivian went to in Gary, Indiana. And some of them, some of the members went to school with Calvin Carter, her little brother. Now, how she met them, like one day they had came into her record store after winning a talent show at their school. And, you know, they had asked Vivian if she knew where they can get a song recorded. They wanted to make a song. And, you know, they had sung for her and she loved their voices. And that's when she told them that she want to work with them. And she had she had them practice at her mother's garage, the whole routine and everything. Now, with their first group signed to their label, Vivian and Jimmy also brought the Spaniel suits, got them a photo shoot, a little car to travel and to perform. And on May 5th, 1953, they released a song called Baby It's You which hit number 10 on Billboard's R&B records chart. Now, their second single title, Good Night, Sweetheart, Good Night, hit number five on Billboard's Rhythm and Blues records chart. And it crossed over to the pop charts from the race records category to become a hit. <laughs> race records. Y'all know before they called it R&B, they used to label black music race music. But anyway, so that same year, a white girl group called the Maguire Sisters did a cover version of Good Night, Sweetheart, Good Night and sold millions of copies, which made Vivian angry. They took they took the Spaniel song, did a cover, and made it bigger and you know and sold millions. And like I said, Vivian got angry, but she and her husband, they had learned the publishing game. So they got paid whenever someone would do a cover of their songs. So that was smart of them to learn that publishing game at that time. But see, seeing the Maguire girls sell millions of copies made Vivian want to put more of a white sounding background on their future records and cross over to the different races. I mean, what it was is the white teens, they love black music, but the teens loved the black music, but their parents didn't like the fact that they was listening to black music. So that's why a lot of the white artists did cover songs of the black music. And the radio station would play the white version. I mean, they was trying to stop black music at that time. They had articles and campaigns out saying, save the people, save the young people, don't buy Negro records and everything. You know, plus the white teens started wanting to hear the real version from the black artists anyway. And that's when Alan Freed started playing it up on his station in New York. But he labeled it rock and roll to make it more you know to make it more acceptable to the white parents now after that right vivian and jimmy decided to move their whole operation to chicago and they opened up their office on record row because the great migration had everybody moving to chicago chicago was just the place to be at that time now record row was a block located in chicago on south michigan avenue with a bunch of other independent record companies like, you know, of course, Chess Records was there. King Records, you know, King Records had James Brown. Brunswick Records had Jackie Wilson. And, you know, later on, Kurt Tom Records by Curtis Mayfield was there. But that was much later on. And, you know, the studio they used to record all their music was called the Universal Recording Corporation, which at the time, was one of the largest independent studios in the country. Then, you know, VJ, they they put their house band together under the leadership of bassist Al Smith. He ran the whole house music for VJ Records. And it was also connected to United Records Distributors. United Record Distributors, which was the first major black-owned music distribution company in the country. And that was ran by some brothers named George and Ernie Leaner, who were the nephews of the radio host Al Benson. Then Calvin Carter, being the one hired to find talent as an A&R for VJ Records, he discovered legendary blues musician Jimmy Reed at a slaughterhouse meat factory. 
and Jimmy Reed at the time had just gotten turned down by Chess Records. So they signed Jimmy Reed and he put out some songs that did very well on the charts like High and Lonesome, You Don't Have to Go, Ain't That Loving You Baby, You Got Me Dizzy and many more. Jimmy Reed <laughs> was a wild boy too that stayed drunk all the time. He stayed drunk so much that the staff at VJ, Calvin Carter say, uh, he would have the cops arrest him, got the cops arrest Jimmy Reed, throw him in jail just so they can pick him up and take him to the studio the next day. Wow, that's crazy. That's how much he used to get drunk all the time. After that, you know, then they hired Ewart Abner because he had the music business knowledge because he used to handle all the financial business at Chance Records. Now see, Ewart Abner, you know, small guy, skinny, graduated from Howard University, got an accounting degree from DePaul, and he carried himself confidence and like he was the smartest guy in the room, and which he was. Even lawyers said he was too intelligent and overqualified to be in the record business. Wow. So when Chance Records shut down, VJ Records made Ewart Abner the president of their label because Vivian and Jimmy didn't really know they didn't really know the business side to the music industry at the time but he was the one that did all the paperwork Ewart Abner would do all the paperwork and collect the money for them when he came on board he hired white and black staff members to work for the company so after that then they signed a group from Chicago called the El Dorados who put out a hit song called At My Front Door which hit number one on the U.S. R&B charts and number 17 on the U.S. pop charts in 1955. Then they signed the legendary group, The Dells. If y'all know who The Dells were, that's the group in The Five Heartbeats. That whole movie is based on The Dells. It's crazy because The Dells started off with Chess Records as the L Rays, but after the single they released on Chess Records didn't make any noise on the charts. Then the Chess dropped them from the label. <laughs> Leonard Chess told Marvin Jr. he couldn't sing. Wow, that's crazy. Marvin Jr. was Eddie Kane's character in the movie, The Five Heartbeats. That's who that was based upon. Leonard Chess told him he couldn't sing. That's crazy. So look, when Chess Records dropped them, they went right across the street to VJ Records and signed with them and released the song, Oh What a Night, which hit number four on the R&B singles chart and years later hit number one on the best-selling soul singles chart i love that song right there man oh what a night another song i love from the dells was stay in my corner beautiful song i like the song always together a heart is a house for love from the five heartbeat soundtrack the dells man one of my favorite groups of all time but anyway so that same year they also had signed legendary bluesman john lee hooker they wanted to sell records in the blues market too, like Chess Records was doing with Muddy Waters and Lil Walter and all of them. And now Vivian and Jimmy was seeing money coming now. Money was coming in. And you know what they, and you know what they was driving? <laughs> Cadillacs. Just like the movie, Cadillac Records. It's the 50s, so they say Vivian was riding around in a gold Cadillac with a mink coat all iced out and everything. Another legendary artist they had signed too, Jerry Butler, the Iceman. They had signed Jerry Butler. Well, actually, Jerry Butler and Curtis Mayfield were friends from uh, Cabrini Green Projects. And they was in the same group called the Roosters, but VJ changed the group's name to Jerry Butler and the Impressions. And in 1958, they released a song called For Your Precious Love that hit number three on the most played R&B chart and number 11 on the Billboard Pop Charts. And according to history, that song, For Your Precious Love, is supposedly the first R&B soul song. Wow, that's the first soul song. But you know, right after that, Jerry Butler went solo and left the group and had a very successful solo career. Then they wanted to get into the gospel market. VJ tried to get into the... They was trying to corner the market. They, they got into the gospel market. VJ Records started signing a bunch of gospel groups like the Staple Singers, the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi, the Highway QCs, the famous Boyer Brothers, the Argo Singers, 
Swan Silver's Tones, uh, The Caravans, Dorothy Love Coats and the Gospel Harmonettes, Maceo Woods, and many more. They had the staple singers, y'all, before they switched to R&B and went to Stax Records. You know, Mavis, when they had staple singers on the gospel, right, Mavis was only 12 years old singing lead on them gospel albums. Wow. Unbelievable. She had one of the most underrated voices ever. She is she one of the greatest female singers ever to do it, too. Now, now another artist they had signed to VJ Records was D. Clark. And he had a big song called Raindrops that hit number two on the Hot 100 charts and number three on the R&B chart. They used to say uh, he was a mixture of Sam Cooke and Jackie Wilson or something like that. Hmm. Now, this other singer, though, they had signed, Gene Chandler, really made VJ Records hot at the time. He really put VJ Records on the map, on VJ. He had the first million-selling single song on VJ, which was called Duke of Earl, which hit number one on both the pop and R&B charts and held the number one spot for three weeks and was on the Hot 100 for a total of 15 weeks. That's a great song right there, Duke of Earl. I love it, man. And, you know, it also has been selected by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as one of the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. That song was so big at that time, man. Like I said, sold one million copies in little over a month. And Gene Chandler is an underrated singer, in my opinion. <laughs> that song Rainbow he had? That was written by Curtis Mayfield. Anyway, now, VJ also has signed Betty Everett, who had the hit songs You're No Good, that hit number five, on the Cashbox R&B Locations chart. And the Shoop Shoop song, It's In His Kiss. That Shoop Shoop, It's In His Kiss song is the one that took her to the top, hitting number one on the Cashbox Magazine R&B charts and number six on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. She had another hit song, too, with uh, Jerry Butler called Let It Be years later that hit number five on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and number one on the Cashbox Soul and R&B charts for three weeks. She was a great singer, too, man. One of my favorite songs from Betty Everett is called uh, There Come a Time that she had back in 1969 that hit number two on the Billboard R&B listening charts and number one on the Cashbox chart. She had a beautiful singing voice, too, though definitely underrated now check this vj also has signed gladys knight and the pips when they were just called the pips that's when glad it was gladys knight her brother bubba knight her sister brenda knight and their cousins william and eleanor guest and they had a song out called every beat of my heart that hit number one on the u.s billboard r&b chart and number six on the billboard hot 100 then VJ started signing a lot of jazz artists to dominate that market. They was trying to dominate everything, man. Now, here's something different and important that VJ Records did for the history books, right? Now, they also started signing white artists. They were signing white artists who couldn't get, they couldn't get deals with white major labels. And it was actually Ewart Abner's idea because he felt that VJ Records could do it all from jazz blues spiritual country western or whatever in an interview you know Ewart abner said instead of doing some covers from some white artists he'll just sign some white artists of his own because he just felt that if vj want to stay in the business then they got to stop thinking of themselves as just a negro company they were the first black record label to do that y'all they started signing white artists too and that's when they had signed Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons had just gotten turned down by gangster music boss Morris Levy, who said this song, he said the song Sherry sounded like crap. And that's when they brought, you know, they brought it to Ewart Abner, who loved the song. He was kind of hesitant at first because, you know, he had a he had the black label, but he was willing to try it. And he, he loved the song Sherry. And, you know, they have some big hits, too, man. The song Sherry, that hit number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 for five consecutive weeks. And it hit number one on the R&B charts for one week. Another song they had was called uh, 
Big Girls Don't Cry. That hit number one for five weeks on the Billboard Hot 100. And, you know, hit number one on the R&B charts, too. The other song they had was called Walk Like a Man. That hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks. And that hit number three on the R&B singles chart. That's crazy. And now, let's get to the Beatles. <laughs> VJ Records were the first ones to give the Beatles a shot in America. Because see, at the time, VJ's chief international representative was a 30-year-old woman named Barbara Gardner, who later on would become the first African-American woman to own and operate her own advertising agency. But anyway, she, she was the one that went to London to make that deal happen for Ewan Abner. Because the Beatles, they was hot at the time in the UK. Overseas, they were hot. And they had a number one record over there in England. And they were signed to EMI Records, who was doing business with Capitol Records in America. EMI Records was trying to get the, you know, EMI Records was trying to get a buzz going for the Beatles in the USA. But like I said, they was doing business with Capitol, but Capitol Records didn't think the Beatles was that hot. They wasn't focused on them, and they turned them down to promote their music in America at the time. And, you know, EMI was also cool with VJ. So they figured that since uh, Capitol Records didn't want them, let's take them to VJ. And they reached out to VJ because actually EMI Records had a number one hit record on the charts in the UK called I Remember You by a guy named Frank Ifield, who was a British Australian country music singer and guitarist who did a yodeling in his music. And EMI Records had asked Ewart Abner if they wanted that song, really. So when they took that song from Frank Ifield, they said, would you take the Beatles too? It was like a package deal. And to be honest, you know, Ewart Abner really, he didn't want the Beatles either, but he wanted the Frank Ifield song. But in order to get the Frank Ifield song, he had to take the Beatles. So he said, whatever. So he took the Beatles too with the Frank Ifield song and acquired the rights to some of the early Beatles recordings and a licensing deal with EMI and got a five-year contract on the Beatles as a pickup on the Frank Ifield contract. VJ really weren't that interested in the Beatles at the time. Nobody in America was. So they acquired the Beatles and they signed them to a contract and they started working with the Beatles, you know, and they released some singles called Please Please Me, Ask Me Why, which was number one overseas. Those songs were number one overseas, but promoting in America, it didn't do that good. I mean, the songs charted, but VJ just, VJ Records just weren't focused on the Beatles at the time. They even misspelled their name. They spelled it B-E-A-T-T-L-E-S. That's how they spelled it. They didn't really care about the Beatles. Then they released some more songs from the Beatles trying to get a buzz going. They had the, they released the song Twist and Shout. It was a cover from the Ozzy Brothers. They had the Beatles do the Twist and Shout cover from the Ozzy Brothers. And, you know, they was working on their album. They still was going to put the Beatles album out. The album was called Introducing the Beatles, but they just, you know, VJ just wasn't focused on the Beatles. They was working on it, but they put it on the shelf and started focusing more on their artists that they had that was doing things. So, that, so the Beatles album just sat on the shelf. But then all of a sudden... The Beatles blew up after they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. And that's when VJ Records turned their attention back on them. But by the time they were trying to focus back on the Beatles, things just started falling apart for VJ Records because the company's president, Ewart Abner, didn't pay the taxes. They owed money to the pressing plants that pressed the records. And, you know, Ewart Abner had a real bad gambling problem and spent a lot of the label's money. Apparently, he owed the boys in Vegas hundreds of thousands of dollars and took money out of VJ Records to pay off his gambling debts. Wow. I don't know if he owed the mob or mafia or whatever at the time, but they say he owed the boys in Vegas. Like I said earlier, Vivian, you know, Vivian and Jimmy Bracken really didn't know the paperwork side of the game. They were they were the shot callers and owned the they owned the company, but Ewart Abner was running the company like he was really the boss. 
and he knew all the finance and stuff and and he wouldn't put a lot of the numbers and the information on paper he would try to keep it up in his head he tried to keep track of everything in his head and stuff they say he would just do crazy stuff like take the company's payroll and fly to vegas and gamble it, gamble all of it wow they say he would win he would win sometimes sometimes he lost a lot of times he also paid a lot of money to djs to play the artist records the payola was real you know they say he would pimp out prostitutes to the djs he did whatever he had to do to keep vj records on top though he did do whatever he had to do to keep the uh, vj records on top but you know in an interview you were abner denied he had a gambling problem he said he didn't have a gambling problem he said he didn't gamble with the company's funds because he owned a third of the company and said he was gambling with his money but you know vivian and jimmy didn't like that man and they fired him they fired Ewart abner and that was around the time that the beatles had blew up and that's when the term the British invasion had took off and the Beatles became so big. They were selling millions of singles a month. Now, the singles that VJ had put out, those singles were selling now. But VJ just couldn't keep up with the orders. They couldn't press up enough records to meet the fans' demand because Ewart Abner had spent the money. They couldn't even pay to press the records up. Wow. You know, and that meant that they couldn't pay the agreement of the license royalties to EMI. So, like I said, they, they fired Ewart Abner. He was now gone. He went and started his own label called Constellation Records, and he took Gene Chandler with him. And, you know, after losing Ewart Abner, that was a big loss because he knew he had all the knowledge on the numbers and the paperwork, and he lost a lot of the company's money. So now... Vivian and Jimmy had to figure things out. So when they didn't pay the Beatles, that's when EMI Records canceled VJ's contract due to non-payment of royalties. But they were still trying to release material from the Beatles because they were the hottest group in the world and now selling millions of records. Like I said earlier, they had the album ready introducing the Beatles, but it, just, it sat on the shelf and now they was trying to put it out. But that's when Capitol Records, who, who didn't like the Beatles at first and wouldn't promote them, they wanted to get back in the picture now. They wanted to get all the rights to the Beatles catalog because, you know, EMI and Capitol, Capitol was owned by EMI. Capitol started releasing the Beatles material after they became successful trying to win the group back from VJ. And they ended up filing a cease and desist lawsuit against vj records for manufacturing and distributing advertising or otherwise disposing of records by the beatles but vj still had a they still had the five-year contract that said they could release that album that they had put on the shelf a while back that uh introducing the beatles album and they put the album out the introducing the beatles on january 10th 1964 which included six covers of songs by black artists and then that's when Capitol Records released their album of the Beatles titled Meet the Beatles. And both albums hit the top of the charts. And they continued to fight in court, but VJ Records, man, they just couldn't, they couldn't fight Capitol Records in court because they didn't have no money. So Capitol Records won all the Beatles right. Wow, that's crazy. Capitol Records was the one that didn't want to do nothing with the Beatles at first. And VJ decided to take them on. As soon as the Beatles uh, blow up, <laughs> then Capitol Records won them back. That's crazy, man. And plus, you know, VJ was going through a lot, man. Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons had filed a lawsuit against them because they weren't receiving enough money from their album sales and royalties. So they left, they left the label and signed to Philip Records. After that, that's when VJ made their executive a guy named Randy Wood, the president of the company, to replace Ewart Abner. And, you know, Randy Wood is the one who brought Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons to the label. But Randy Wood convinced Vivian and Jimmy to move their whole operation to Southern California, where he was at. And when they moved the company from Chicago to California, it, it just didn't work because they went from 15 or 20 employees 
to like 200 employees overnight. Everybody in there had a store of their own. There were leased cars all over the place and Randy Wood was signing more white pop artists to the label and a lot of black artists left VJ Records by then. It was just a disaster. So Jimmy Bracken, <laughs> he fired everybody from California, split ways with Randy Wood and they went back and hired Ewart Abner. They hired Ewart Abner back but by then, things just continued to fall in California. So that's when they decided to move the company back to Chicago. And they was trying to make a comeback with the label. They was trying to make a comeback. They had signed Little Richard, who at the time had Jimi Hendrix as a background guitar player. And they released the Little Richard album. But VJ Records didn't have enough money to promote, promote the album, though. So the album flopped. They also had signed a group called The Big Three, who at the time had Cass Elliott before she had joined the Mamas and Papas. They also had signed a young Billy Preston. And on August 20th, 1965, they released his second album titled The Most Exciting Organ Ever. But by 1966, the company just didn't have no money. Everybody was suing them. Randy Wood came back, sued the company for a breach of contract company went bankrupt man it's out of money so they had to file for bankruptcy and it was three million dollars in debt and the label just had to label shut down the irs even seized vivian carter's record shop in gary indiana wow and you know after the label shut down man vivian carter had to go back to where she started which is doing radio and jimmy bracken he tried to start another record label but it never took off. And you know, him and Vivian, Vivian and Jimmy, man, they just got divorced. Wow, that's sad. They lost the label. Label had to shut down, got divorced. Back to square one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, in an interview, right, somebody had asked Vivian how she felt about the rise and fall of her record company. And she said that she had learned too late the art of looking over the shoulder of those who work for you but she didn't miss a thing that's all behind her now she said basically she was saying that she trusted and gave too much power to Ewart Abner and you know Randy Wood who they made uh, the president in California he sued him right but then he ended up getting all of the VJ's music catalog and then they sold it and then it was sold to another company then it was sold to somebody else. So I don't even know who owns the catalog now, but the catalog has over 5,000 master recordings. You know, Ewart Abner, he went on to work with Barry Gordy after after VJ dissolved. <laughs> Ewart Abner went on to work with Barry Gordy and Stevie Wonder and all of them, man. He helped them become successful. And he also became a spokesperson for having ownership in the music industry. He started helping people with their music careers. On February 20th, 1972, Jimmy Bracken died. He ended up passing away. And in 1989, Vivian Carter died in a nursery home from a bunch of health issues she was dealing with, like high blood pressure, diabetes, strokes, which left her paralyzed and everything, man. And you know, this would make a great movie because it was the first major record company to be owned and operated by African Americans, a husband and wife team from the 1950s. And I couldn't really find a book about VJ Records story, but so hopefully somebody will put one out soon. There's a documentary called Cradle of Rock and Roll narrated by Etta James that speak a lot about VJ's journey. But a lot of people don't know, Vivian Carter and Jimmy Bracken started one of the first successful black record labels in the world. And they don't get they don't get no credit, man. Before Motown, there was VJ Records. Vivian Carter was 69 years old, and James Bracken, Jimmy Bracken, was 63 years old. Rest in peace to both of them, man. They legends, man. VJ Records.